In these perilous times, see from current events how biblical prophecy is coming to pass in front of our eyes. You're watching In the Last Days, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. With Martin and Natalie Blackham, thank you to our friends and partners who make this program possible. Now, here's Martin and Natalie. Shalom dear friends and welcome to the In the Last Days program. It's wonderful to be able to be with you today. And the amazing is today we have an interview with Eliezer Ben Yehuda. Eliezer, thank you for being here. Eliezer, to give you just a bit of an introduction, is the grandson of the Eliezer Ben Yehuda, who was the revivist of the Hebrew language. So it's very historical today and we feel very privileged to have you, Eliezer. Thank you. Yes, and, and just know, friends, we have an audience today, so if you hear some noise, don't worry. It's the people who are exp exprimin, ex expressing themselves, saying, oh, something is happening here, and, you know, it's, it's life, so it's great. So, shalom to you, Elias. Shalom. It is so nice to be with you. Yes. We have been in contact with one another for a very long time, yes. but this is actually the first time that we're meeting face to face. Yes. It's so historical it's for me. Very, very you know, nice for me. Yes, I was, and I would maybe just also introduce on this book, The Tongue of the Prophet, which is why we are here, because he really touched us, seeing that the Hebrew language, he, he had a hard life, but he carried on doing what he had in his heart, and with the up and down of life, he said, no, I know that I have to do something. And we felt like we needed to do something with the studio and, and like have life close to the Jewish people. So thank you again to be here and to be an inspiration to many. My pleasure. I'm glad to be here. This book, Tongue of the Prophets, was written a very long time ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, the interesting thing about it is that it was written by Robert St. John, who was a Christian man, who was a, a journalist. And he actually participated as a journalist uh, reporting about uh, the Second World War. Uh, and especially, uh, he was very touched by events that took place in Romania, mm -hmm. where there was a terrible, terrible attack on the Jews and the slaughtering of Jews. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wrote about it in a book called Foreign Correspondent. And at the end of the war, he went back to the United States and he went on a lecture tour. And then, of course, you know, two years after the end of the war, mm -hmm. we had the United Nations decision on the creation of two nations, a Hebrew nation and an Arab nation in Palestine, the British protectorate, British mandate area. And um, the... Uh, Arab countries that were members of the United Nations, mm -hmm. an organization that was set up to preserve peace, announced that they're going to war. Mm -hmm. They said, we will not accept this decision of the United Nations. The state of Israel, nobody knew it was going to be called Israel. The state mm -hmm. of the Hebrews, the state of the Jews, will not come into being. We will prevent it. And we will push the Jews into the sea. This hasn't changed. This hasn't changed. The words, was still the words may be new, but the melody is yes, common, right? Same. We've heard it before. So what happened was that uh, he decided that he's going to go and he's going to cover another war. And indeed, he went to Jerusalem and he covered the war and he wrote a book. He was here for two years during the war, and he wrote a book that was called Shalom Means Peace. Mm -hmm. And it was about how the Israelis are looking for peace. You know, they greet one another by saying peace. And, uh, you know, if you ask, how is somebody, you say, Ma Shalom. Mm -hmm. Again, you're saying, what's the peace of somebody else like? Everything is peace, peace, peace. But, you know, the prophet says, Shalom, Shalom, Ve'en Shalom. Mm -hmm. Peace, peace, they cry, but there is no peace. And there was no peace, and that's what he wrote about. Mm -hmm. So when he was done, he went back to the United States, 
and his good luck or bad luck, depending on how you look at it, was that he was sitting on a plane to fly back to the United States from the airport here in, near Tel Aviv. He sat down next to this cantankerous elderly lady who was the widow of Eliezer ben Yehuda, my grandmother, you see? And so they sat together and they had a long trip. A flight to the United States used to be 36 hours. You see, 36 hours. You flew from uh, Ben Gurion, it's not called Ben Gurion, it was called Lod Airport. Mm -hmm. From Lod, you flew to either Rome mm -hmm. or Paris. Mm -hmm. And from there, you flew to Shannon in Ireland. And from there, you flew to uh, Reykjavik in Iceland. Oh, wow. And from there, you flew to Newfoundland in Canada. And from Newfoundland, a wreck yourself, you arrived at uh, the airport of New York. Amazing. Idlewild Airport uh, in New York. As we it was don't called. know how blessed we are. It, exactly, um, in so many ways. So this poor fellow sat next to my grandmother, who was the wife of this man and helped him so to bring about Hemda? the Chemda, exactly. Helped him, Eliezer, to bring about this rebirth of the Hebrew language. Yes. And she said to this man, she started talking to him, and asked him, what, what, you know, what did you do in Israel? You know, and he told her, I wrote a book. And she said, God provided you here next to me. She was going to the United States because she broke her hip, mm -hmm. you see. And uh, she was going to have an operation. And she said, God provided you because I'm going to the United States and one of my purposes is to have a book published about my husband. She said, and so he said, oh, that's very interesting. She says, you will write that book. <laughs> and he says, so says you and who else? And she says, God says so. And he says, wow, that's a big combination here. <laughs> and he said to her, but I'm not, I'm not the man. I'm not your man. He says, first of all, I don't write books to order. Secondly, I don't know anything about you or about your husband. And frankly, I'm not interested. I have this book. I'm going to go on a lecture tour. And she says, don't be foolish. <laughs> the, books is the book is written already. Mm. It's written in Hebrew. And uh, I will help you. I'm going to be in the United States for a while. I will help you to change it to English. And you will write it. And you will get the credit for writing it. And the book will come out, you know. And she talked and talked and talked for the whole flight. And, you know, he got weaker and weaker because it's a long trip. She did not because a flight or anything else wouldn't scare her. And so by the end of the trip, he, he, was, ready, he was ready to sign on the dotted line, you see. And that's how this book came into existence. And if you remember, the book starts by saying this is a story about a Jew written by a non-Jew yes. for non-Jews as well as Jews. Yes. And this was very, very important. Mm -hmm. And he wrote the story the way my grandmother wanted the story to be told. Okay. And the important thing about, you know, this book mm -hmm. is about the rebirth of the Hebrew language. Yes. But that is not really the full story of Eliezer ben Yehuda. Mm -hmm. And things changed from 1949, when the war was over and the state of Israel was a brand new country and everybody was talking about the real miracle, the, the miracle of the rebirth of this country, you see? Now Israel is an old dog and people have managed to twist things so much, all these new historians, Jews and non-Jews alike, and all of a sudden today the story of David and Goliath has a giant David and a minuscule Goliath, and the Jews have become the bad person, and the others who started the war and who refused to make peace have become the victims. And I said, we need to go back to the original, and we must show people two things, people around the world, we have to show them two things. 
First of all, that the Jews are not Goliath. Very true. To show that we are really a very humble and peace-loving people who have been forced to carry a gun and protect our lives. But more important than that, I wanted people to know that everything that the Jewish people have done, they have done because it was the plan of God Almighty. And that what was done was done by the word of God. And the best example to do it was to write a book about Eliezer ben Yehuda. And so I wrote this book, which is called Fulfillment of Prophecy. And I say that Eliezer ben Yehuda was touched by God to do the fulfillment of the prophecies of old, the prophecies of Isaiah, the prophecies of Amos, the prophecies of Zephaniah, all the prophets, and all the others, including Jesus and including the Christians. I'm a Jew, mm -hmm. but I think that there is a Judeo-Christian tradition that makes us brothers in faith mm -hmm. in one way or another. I agree with that. You see? Right. And so I went and I wrote this book, mm -hmm. Fulfillment of Prophecy, in which I show how Eliezer ben Yehuda, everything that he did, you see, it's not just that he brought the language back to life. It's also that he was the first pioneer to come to this country for the specific purpose of renewing mm -hmm. the sovereignty of the Jewish people under God in the land of Israel. And, and that you don't find in Robert St. John's book. And, and he stimulated people to come here. Absolutely. He was like a leader. Absolutely. Yeah. He was a new prophet, you might say. And he's you see, still with all due humility, you know, I don't want to yeah. claim things that are hard to prove. I, I can say that he was a prophet of his time. <laughs> exactly. Because he couldn't do this work he would have not been able to do. No. That is correct. He should have died. Know, exactly. I mean, he was sick. destined to die. When he was 20 years old, he contracted tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. He went to a clinic. He saw a doctor, and the doctor said to him, put your affairs in order because you are going to be dead before the year is out. Mm -hmm. and, and he lived 44 years and 11 months after that. And you are here because he fulfilled the mission. Absolutely. And, it, and your dad was born because it's Absolutely. just amazing. And I remember also the story, I think is in your book, of the finger, mm -hmm. because I didn't notice on the pictures. This finger. This finger. Yes. So the right one. Yes, that one. and you know what they call this finger? Because when This you is write. called the finger of authority. Oh. Ask any mother and she will tell you. Obviously. When the children misbehave, she goes like that. And she says, wait till your father gets home, you see? So this is the finger of authority. Mm. And, and he story. had an infection when he was a child. He had a little something, you know, we don't know how the infection came. Maybe he had a thorn, mm -hmm. you see, or a cut or something, and it got infected, and it became full of gangrene, and it turned purple. And in those days, nobody knew what, what infection is, you know, especially not in Eastern Europe. And so if they didn't do something about it, he would have died. And his mother was a very good woman, a very good mother, and she tried, you know, she used hot compresses on it, and she tried cold compresses on it, and she tried this and she tried that, and the things got worse. It, got, it went, it went from, from pink to white to blue to purple. And she said, ay, 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 purple is definitely not a good color for a human being. And suddenly, the finger of God, you know, the, the leading finger of God, 
Somebody came and said to her, there is a doctor, a very famous surgeon, and for some reason, this evening, he's staying at our little town inn. Tomorrow he's going to be on his way and he will never come back this way. But today he's here. And she picked up her child, her baby, and she took him to the inn. Mm -hmm. And she went and she disturbed that poor doctor when he was eating by showing him that terrible finger, which of course stopped him from eating. And he said to her right away, he said, this finger has to come off. And she riled against him. She said, oh no, we don't want to do that. And he says, well, you know, then just bid farewell to your child because he will die. If you will let it go beyond the finger, it'll spread very quickly and it will kill him. And she, she said, and she said, if it is the will of God to take this finger, we will give him the finger. And so the doctor went to his room and he fetched his doctor's satchel and he took out his instruments and he ordered a bottle of vodka, and half of it he drank, and the other half he uh, cleaned the hand and his instruments, and he cut off the finger, and he made a clean uh, uh, scar, which eventually healed, and there wasn't even a scar left. You know, it was just a missing part here. You see? And he wrote with just two fingers. There was no finger in the middle. But sure. basically, uh, he had a mission. You see? And it is very interesting from my perspective mm -hmm. to realize that his mission is not over. Because now, now, the lie is getting legs. You see? And people are saying that the Jews came and took a land that belonged to somebody else and that they, they're not a nation, no, no. you I see? Mean, if they're not a nation, then their language is not a language, which of course is not true. And of course there are those who say, well, you know, it all started after the Second World War because the European nations were so obligated to the Jews because they allowed the Holocaust to happen. Of course, then they say, and you know, there was no Holocaust. Yeah. <laughs> you see, so the Holocaust that didn't happen happened because those imperialist nations, you see, didn't take care of their Jews. And so now they're trying to uh, buy them off the few remnants that were there and they're doing it by giving them something that didn't belong to them in the first place. But this, when you see all these things, it doesn't make any sense. Like for the Hebrew, I mean, I, I know that when God was starting to make us like as Christian discovering the Jewish roots, it's like, okay, we have to go back to the Hebrew language. That and suddenly correct. we are discovering the Hebrew language is a language of creation. And I spoke with some Christians saying that, and they said, how do you know that? I say, read in your Bible, we haven't been taught this way, but if you read your Bible and Genesis, from Genesis 1 to Genesis 11, it was only the Hebrew language. It wasn't Aramaic or well, whatever, whatever. None of it was. By the way, I also said that Jesus spoke Hebrew. Yeah, I don't agree with the people that say, I agree too. you know, that he spoke Aramaic. He did not speak Aramaic. Mm -hmm. It was only 200 years later when they wrote the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Remember, the New Testament is not a memo that was written by Jesus. I agree. It's a yeah. book that was written by his disciples and maybe it was the grandchildren of the disciples. It was the words of Mark and Matthew and Luke, you know, mm -hmm. but it was the words that were passed on orally 
before they were written down because it was very difficult to write back in those days. But everybody, even at that time, in Jesus' time, they were speaking Hebrew. Absolutely. Like the apostles, the Absolutely. disciples with yes, were speaking yes, Hebrew. Yes, they yeah. spoke Hebrew. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. We need to dig in you know, all these things. You know, it's like yes. we, we, really, Martin and I, we really have this heart of seeing things. So in a way, it's not like like Hemma, Hemda, mm -hmm. who see this this man uh, Robert St. Jones. I think there is somebody above Absolutely. who is making us who directing. Yes. That's what I said. You know, yeah. it was his bad luck or his good luck, or you know, it was, you know, there was a hand that was leading him. Yes to sit next to Hemda. Yes. You know, you by reading this book, for me, I read it at least twice. And for coming here, it was the book, I said. Mm -hmm. I really said, no, he had a hard time, but he knew what he had to do. So it's not always easy, but we know what we have to do, so we have to carry on. And, and the thing when I read this story, because I didn't know very much about Israel, like being Christian, not Jewish background, I had to learn a lot of things. And when he wrote the book, and I think it's in his book that suddenly I was learning about the history at the same time. Mm -hmm. And thinking about the book, he doesn't speak about it, but thinking about the book, I say, wait a minute, wait a minute. All the history is, is, is with Israel in the middle. It's not France here, England here, America, and like there is a bit of history, no. All of them, it depends on what's happening in this tiny country because it's, it's what started, it was in Israel, the temple was there, the mountain was there, the Jerusalem was there, the, the country was there. And it is still the same way. Exactly. And you know, make us think in the right many way. I spent living and teaching in the United States of America. And I befriended many, many Christian ministers. And I sent them all to come and be inspired mm -hmm. by the mountain of the Lord and be inspired by the streets of Jerusalem. You know, it's not... Jerusalem is not like any other place in the world. I agree. Jerusalem has sidewalks that sing hallelujah. You don't find that elsewhere. No. And so I sent many a minister here. Mm -hmm. And some of them came as pilgrims. Mm -hmm. And some of them came defiantly. Mm -hmm. I'm going to prove to him that it doesn't mean anything to me. And they came back humble. Mm -hmm. I had one minister just a couple of years ago. I knew him for seven years. Mm -hmm. You know, like the... The, the year of release, you know. I knew him for seven years, and for seven years, he was, he's an evangelist, he goes all over the world, he has a ministry in 40 countries. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, why should I go to Israel? It's such a small country, and you're not allowed to, ev to, to okay. evangelize, mm -hmm. you see. So he said to me, I'm not interested. And he says, and anyhow, I've been in all those countries, I've been in countries... Uh, in Middle Asia, and I've been in countries in the former Soviet Union, and I've been in Africa, and I've been, you know, where hasn't he been, you see? So he said to me, why should I go to Israel? And I said, you know, we're friends, and we're friends for seven years now. I said, this is the year of release. I'm releasing you to go to the Holy Land. Mm -hmm. I said, go there to feel the presence of your God. Go there to find Jesus. And he came back with tears in his eyes. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, I was going there to find Jesus and I was going to come back and chide you why you don't accept Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he says, when I was there, I encountered the Father. Mm -hmm. And I understood you so much better. You see? So, and this comes because it's Jerusalem. Because it says in Jeremiah and elsewhere, for out of Zion shall come forth the teaching and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. It doesn't come from Rome, and goodness knows it doesn't come from Salt Lake City. It comes from Jerusalem. 
and everything else is a transmission. You see, it's second hand. Yes, very true. But that's the way it is. The word is coming from Zion, yes. and it's so true. Yes. Listen, friends, this is so just amazing, you know. It's, thank you, Eliezer, that you give us a glimpse of your grandfather and, and what you are doing. We're going to do some other program also too. This is the beginning, you know, we're like a chain. And, and things have been done and things still has to be done. So we are so pleased to show you, you know, it's like he's a Jew, I'm a Christian, and we are working together because we have the same father and we are walking away that God is, is doing some reconciliation and that the Torah is the Torah. And the fulfillment of all the prophecies which will bring the time God willing, soon, yes. we just don't know when, no. but we want to see the time when God's sovereignty will be recognized. And that sovereignty will fulfill the end time prophecies. End time does not mean that this world will end. No, it's Quite the contrary. Right. It's when this world will begin to be what our Father wanted it to be. It will be like a Garden of Eden. The whole world will be a place, a place of peace, a place of cooperation and collaboration. The God of the Hebrews said to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I teach you love. Mm -hmm. Jesus said the same thing. Mm -hmm. Jesus was raised as a Jew, yes. and he spoke as a Jew, and he spoke love, as a Jew. Mm -hmm. This is something that many Christians, unfortunately, know. don't know. It's very true. You see? No. That, the truth, that, that, that the truth is love. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Eliezer, for coming and sharing what you have in your heart. And don't, don't forget, we are living in the last days. You've been watching In The Last Days, a TV program with Martin and Natalie Blackham, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. If you would like to financially support the program or find out about conferences, meetings, or ministry products, then please contact us with the details on your screen. Visit our easy-to-use website at www.inthelastdays.com and register for our free e-newsletter Get the latest news from Israel, product information, online video teaching, or watch today's TV program at a time that's convenient to you. Thank you again, friends and partners, for making this program possible. See you in two weeks, same time, same station, for the next program from In the Last Days.